establishing the wife for task for uh, task for the summons you will know uh, within the very hub, which now goes from strength to strength. Also, <coughs> within this particular time, we've had invested half a million pounds within the three years within this particular area with this building and the, the, the facilities outside for young children and toddlers. Also, we've had the ethic, as you will know about the police, in terms of you know making sure we target drug uh, users and drug abuse and antisocial behaviour within this particular patch. We've had some success with that. Assisted with GCC land being made available to cube housing for the heating plant to help with cheaper energy for, for local residents. Tesco rebuilt and jobs for local people, including within the wine a number of people that did get work trained and did get jobs in the, the, the Tesco. Brought services into the wine for us such, such as North Communities United, Glasgow Life to provide much needed youth diversity, diversity services with, along with family services. And I just will finally say, I know I've only got half a minute left, I will be supporting labour pledges of five month additional children um, child care for all three year olds, build three and a half thousand new homes for rent, create one thousand new jobs each year for young people, graduates and over the fifties, tackle litter and dog fouling by employing important officers, provide all eighty year olds with a hundred pound winter heating payment each year and fight any unfair touch to Glasgow bus services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> I'm going to ask the Green candidate, Steve Parrish, to make his five-minute case for election. And as I say, uh, any issues with well, schools, community leaders' agenda, and uh, whether or not to meet with community leaders and sports facilities and the event on Sunday, uh, obviously issues for this audience. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm Steve Parrish. I'm the Green Party candidate for Maryland Kelvin. I'm originally from Denmark, but uh, I spent the last 30 years here on and off, mainly in the West End and Mary Hill. Um, now, what we're faced with is uh, huge budget cuts, whether we like it or not. The Scottish government uh, cut back on uh, public service like nobody ever, ever has before. The Scottish government has unfortunately passed it on, so we're in a bit of a straitjacket. So the question is, how do we address what to cut because something will have to be cut unless we look at ways of generating revenue for the city. So one of the things that Green Group would like to do with uh, anybody who's willing in Glasgow City Council is to create a renewable energy company uh, which can be publicly owned, it could be in partnership with uh, community groups and social enterprise groups. But the crucial thing about this is it will generate revenue for the city so it can alleviate some of the cutbacks and save some of the essential services that are crucial for the well-being of uh, City of Glasgow. And this could be done in lots of different ways. We can use the feed-in tariffs or the renewable heat incentive. We can uh, think about uh, using combined heat and power for new housing developments. That will address fuel poverty, which one in three Glasgow regions suffer from. We can retrofit public buildings where it's appropriate and practical with uh, solar PV, solar thermal. Uh, sewage works, we could look at doing um, producing biogas as sewage works and that biogas can be used to run public service vehicles uh, buses, taxis, but certainly all the vehicles owned by the city uh, it's not particularly uh, innovative what it would be to Glasgow, but it's been done elsewhere in Europe uh, so there's no reason why we shouldn't do it here as well so a publicly owned rev uh, renewable energy company would be a way of solving some of the problems that we're going to have to face in the next five years whether we like it or not um, and it goes without saying that there's possibilities of building uh, publicly owned wind, wind farms uh, to the north of the city and the south of the hills. And again, uh, to give you an example, uh, one wind turbine will generate 12,000 pounds. Uh, 11 watt kilowatt wind turbine will generate 12,000 pounds of profit a year. And there's no reason why the city of Glasgow should do this. There's an island in Denmark called Samsung. They have 100% self sufficient energy. And there's lots of other examples uh, of community projects around Scotland where they do it. If they can do it, we should be doing it in Glasgow as well. The same thing is a lot of people are disenfranchised with politicians 
Um, naturally, with all the things that have happened the last 10 years, and if you look around your community, go down in the street, if you think things are better now than they were 10 or 20 years ago, fine, keep voting for the person you've always voted for, or the colour, flavour of the party you've always voted for. But if you think now's the time for some changes, some new ideas and some innovation, addressing some solutions for the future, then perhaps think of voting for somebody else, such as the Green Party. We're willing to work with anybody on constructive ideas. It's about ideas and not personalities. And at the end of the day, it's boiled down to compromise. We're willing to work with anybody who will look at solutions rather than just how to cut back and tinkering around the edges. One of the things we want to do is we want to reorganize or restructure the area committees in Glasgow. Because at the moment, it's just the three of the four councillors in each ward that makes the decisions as to what happens to the budgets for those wards. We want to involve community councils in particular, any social enterprises or other community partnerships, residents associations, that sort of thing. We want to involve them in the area committees. Uh, maybe not the voting rights, but perhaps the community councils, councils could have voting rights, but we want everybody to have an input in how the budget is spent locally. And I think that's crucial in getting, if you like, democracy down to grassroots levels. Uh, and that's another thing we want to do. And I'm sure that I've heard other parties echoing this idea. So, um, but that's, I think, quite crucial. Get people involved again. Public transport is something that most people in Glasgow are dependent on. So we want to try and work on re-regulating bus services. It's not something the council will do, but I will work with the two green MSPs in Parliament and other MSPs, and I know that a lot of other councils are keen to re-regulate bus services somehow, but we should be looking at ways of making public transport better. Certainly, if we can't re-regulate it, we should make more better demands on things like timetables and routes and so on. And one of the things we'd like to do is to introduce free bus travel for under 16 year olds to encourage good habits when they're young by using public transport. We also want to allocate 10% of the transport budget in Glasgow to active travel, which means walking and cycling. In other words, improving public footpaths and cycling paths and so on. So they're just three of the ideas that we have. Um, I'm sure you've got some questions I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Last point did invite the SNP candidate to speak. Uh, he was here as well, but he didn't want to be on camera, that's a shame. So I'm going to instead invite uh, Liam Turbot, the SNP candidate, to make his case for election. And again, I, I would ask if you could uh, address the schools issue, um, the issue of uh, the community leaders agenda uh, and uh, whether or not you'll meet with community leaders and what he's going to do about sports facilities and whether you'll support the event on Sunday. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me along today. As Nick said, I'm standing for the Scottish Socialist Party in this ward. Um, the SNP are fielding candidates across the city really to get people the opportunity to vote for uh, someone outside the mainstream, to show their range in the mainstream parties, all of whom are promising really much of the same when it comes to the key questions facing communities in these elections. Not one of the mainstream political parties is willing to stand up and be counted when it comes to opposing these huge cuts that are being implemented, which do have a very direct impact on things at a local level. The Labour City Council have tried to shift the blame on the SNP and all the way to in turn tried to shift the blame on the Tories and the Dems, but they try and blame each other for the cuts. The SNP ministers at Hollywood seem able to defy Westminster when it comes to independence referendum nearly every day. When it comes to the cuts, they roll over and implement them. Why can't councillors stand up and be counted? Why can't politicians at Hollywood stand up and be counted in opposing the cuts and leading resistance to them? Um, I can make an absolute guarantee that SSP councillors won't implement any cuts, won't vote for any cuts in jobs and services. And um, we've well, attempted to lead a mass campaign of defiance against Hollywood and Westminster proposed budget based on the needs of local communities rather than cutting services to keep the Tories happy. Um, we're not just about opposing the guts, obviously we want to propose alternatives as well. Our model for a replacement for the council tax would bring in huge extra money to local councils um, with an income-based service tax. So we've made 8 out of 10 people better off um, by taxing those at the highest top of society a lot more. Um, there's a crisis of inequality across the UK. Scotland uh, that's only been worsened by the unwillingness of politicians to stand up to the cuts agenda of austerity. Uh, just over a third of children in this ward grow up in poverty. 20% of young people are unemployed. Yet this is the real scandal, not a budget deficit. Uh, and the way to, to solve this is by increasing public services and enhancing them and redistributing wealth, not slashing jobs and services, which is obviously not going to get a the poorest artists. On some of these local issues, um, I was preferably involved with the campaign to save the two schools in the winter. Um, and I absolutely would support the opening of a new school here. Um, 
I think all, I think definitely in terms of class sizes, we should be trying to keep all class sizes under 20 in primary schools. Um, absolutely support that. Um, in terms of the community agenda, I've read through that and would absolutely support um, the pledges in that. And uh, yeah, absolutely, the SSP is all for uh, local democracy and bringing decisions down to a very grassroots level. Other leaflets have got a pledge um, called the People's Budgets, so really letting communities decide where budgets should be prioritised. Um, and yeah, I hope to be there on Sunday at Mary Ellen. I think it's scandalous that Glasgow Life uh, threatened the police on people that were just trying to go out and do something good for their community. So um, on May the 3rd, the coaches have a choice. They have a choice of voting for one of the mainstream parties who want to implement cuts or roll over and accept the, the ideological motivated cuts of the Gondam Coalition in Westminster, or principled fighters who will stand up and resist the cuts and present these budgets based on the needs of people in Glasgow and not implement any cuts. Thanks. Okay. Does anyone have any co uh, questions to ask? If you could pass forward your bits of card, noted your questions, we'll take them in turn and ask it to the candidates. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Improvements <coughs> made to roads, potholes, some very deep, the Wineford area, and snow and ice. Uh, better lighting and, and parking, and I just want to know what. Uh, we'll, we'll just take the candidates from right to left. What uh, you're going to do with these issues? Um, in terms of potholes, um, can I say that for the last couple of years, with this extreme weather, uh, initially uh, two years ago, the, the, the pothole money that Glasgow City Council spent was £2 million. It was moved to £8 million last year to, this is all, all over Glasgow, uh, and this year it's doubled again, and with some, I must say, I think a million coming from the central government to, to assist with that. But it, the, the work is ongoing. Uh, if you know, if you've noticed that Merrier Road has being revamped totally from uh, the Tesco right up to the, the uh, near enough the, the library. So work is ongoing. It's just that it's a massive, massive amount of work to, to cover the whole of the city. And I hope that within the Wineford, that should be also uh, the portal should be re resolved very soon. Um, in terms of lighting, can I say that there is. Um, ongoing pressure from ourselves and Lord promised a while back uh, in terms of having the lights changed from the, the, the orange colour to white and that's an ongoing, it is delayed slightly but it's going to come, the lights will be all replaced therefore that would, hopefully that should resolve the issue about lights. Anything on that? Mr. Wayne, address that issue. Okay. Yeah, I think potholes are a real issue in this city, though, too well as somebody who cycles a lot. And it's not just a habit for car drivers, it's also one of the schools and cyclists. And I think, yeah, absolutely, we do need to invest in, in the roads. Um, so we support that. In terms of looking nice, I think it's, these are existing council services of gritting and things, and they should be, be made to function properly. Yeah. Um, absolutely, better lighting as well. Um, there's parts of the city that are very dark walking around the night. Um, and yeah, lighting does need to be improved. Uh, yeah, um, potholes. Uh, it, it seems like uh, it's endemic in Glasgow because you go everywhere else where they've had equally severe weather or even worse weather. Uh, if you go uh, east, west, or north of Scotland, uh, they have more severe weather regularly. Uh, but if you take Aberdeen and Dundee, they don't have half the potholes we do. So. I do question whether it's the case of uh, the roads weren't particularly well built to start with or whether a lot of the, re the repairs were substandard uh, and I've got a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that a lot of the repairs are substandard. Uh, so it boils down to whether the council are actually enforcing proper quality control when the work is carried out. So that's one thing I would like to address as a councillor is how the roads department, um, how they quality control, especially roads uh, repairs done by utility companies, 
because I get the impression quite often that uh, instead of using 300 mil, uh, 30 mil uh, aggregate, they might use uh, 20 and so on to save money. Marielle Rose is a good example. Uh, I don't know who, who've uh, just relayed it, but as, just as you turn up, Mary, uh, Queen Mountain Park turn left, there's two inspection covers uh, just on your left, and they've not put asphalt around it, and that's a bit too much now. So that just ex that's a good example of that's a road that's just been relayed, yet it's not been completed. And whoever's been out to inspect that, the foreman or somebody from the road department, I'd like to ask questions about that. So there is a historic, possibly historical reasons why we've got so many potholes in Glasgow, and we need to address that. Uh, moving forward, it's a huge project. Uh, I was told by somebody else that the, the head of the roads department says it's, uh, it will take a decade to relay all the roads. Well, let's get started. <laughs> we've got to solve the problem, so well, let's get started. Um, but it is scandalous, and it's something I'd like to look at. Um, of course, enormous damage to cars, and uh, like the MI cycle quite a lot. It's the most dangerous part of the road, actually, in the gutter. Um, another thing about ice and snow, somebody asked about that. Um, I've noticed when the gritters go out, uh, the aggregate of the gravel, it's there for months afterwards. In fact, it's there during the summer as well because it's not been swept up. And that causes another problem uh, at quite some expense is that when there's a flash flood, cloud burst with all the floodings. Uh, I think Kelvedale Road is a good example, Lockburn Road where I live, always flooded when it's heavy rainfall because nobody's been out to speed up the roads afterwards. Now, there's a simple solution to that. Don't use gravel. Uh, use sand or saline solution. Uh, if you use saline solution, rather than spraying salt, uh, what they do in, uh, in Denmark is they use salt water instead because then you only use a third, which means the vehicle can go three times as far and salt the water tends to stay on the road, where salt doesn't it, it gets swept into the roadside and then it causes damage to vegetation and plants and so on. So it's just a case of doing things differently. Um, and again, these are some of the things I'd like to do as a council. I'd like to get some of the civil servants to look at things differently. Because we can do lots of things differently without it costing more money, it's actually more cost effective. So, and again, um, you know, that might address some of the problems with the potholes because of the flooding. Because once you get flooding and it freezes again, it just causes more damage to the roads. Um, so, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Okay, we have a number of questions here, and uh, uh, what we're going to do is take them two at a time and again run through. Uh, we do have plenty of time, we're 25 minutes in, but we've got another good wee while. So, I take these in order that I receive them. Social housing, what the candidate's going to do about social housing. And do you think the council tax has failed? If not, what do you propose to do about it? Okay, again, wait till left. Um, in terms of housing, I, I did say earlier on when, when I spoke that we are hoping that uh, within the next term we can have 3,500 houses, new houses built. And also there are some on the ground in terms of the locks, the 180 houses have been built. Uh, most of them will be social housing. There will be some for shared equity, but that's housing built also. Um, it, at the moment, finances are very strained, as everybody will know. But also the fact that this is now a TRA area, or the translation uh, uh, regeneration area. Whenever money is available, this area, along with two others in Glasgow, would be the first to actually get that investment. So that hopefully that should, you know, um, um, improve the situation uh, somewhat. Um, sorry, what was that question? The other question was, do you think the council tax is fair? If not, what do you propose hmm. to do about it? I think that's that's an issue that's been, you know, um, challenging a, a lot of uh, councillors for the last few years. And the uh, Glasgow administration last time put together a cross-party group in terms of looking at that and they have still to report in terms of what their outcome was for that. Uh, I know there's different views on how we should go about it. Different parties have different views on how we should go about it, but that, that none of them seems to have really come up with, with the best solution. So until we get something that's fairer, you just have to go with what we've got. So yes, I think we should look at uh, another system that everybody can come on board with. Yeah, the same two questions. Okay, yeah. Um, in terms of social housing, I think we've, there's a chronic undersupply of social housing. Waiting lists are far, far too high. Um, and we do need a, a huge program across the country of building social housing. 
um, where she could solve numerous problems of mass youth unemployment, why not get young people in apprenticeships and building social housing? Um, it could also stimulate the economy in terms of an economic stimulus. Um, I'm su surprised to hear my fellow candidates say that uh, most of the houses being built at Mary Hill Locks are going to be social housing. From my understanding, there's 800 being built overall, of which less than 20% are actually going to be social housing, which I think really isn't good enough at all. That was a social housing requirement but that was just thrown out the window. Um, and I, Hundreds of houses were demolished, and most of them social housing, and very few social houses are actually going to be built to replace them, which I think is an absolute scandal and needs to be investigated fully. Um, in terms of the council tax, I think the council tax is deeply regressive, and it does need replacement by uh, an income-based alternative rather than some sort of vague classification based on the size of your home, which really isn't fair at all. Um, we have millionaires like Fred Goodwin and Brian Sutter who pay about two or three thousand pounds council tax on their mansions, while hardworking people on average salaries are paying not much less proportionally. I think like that people on an average wage pay hundreds of times more proportionally than millionaires um, in terms of their income against the council tax. So yeah, we definitely do need to scrap the council tax, and the SSP has a, a fully worked out proposal. And the Scottish Service Tax, which would be 8 out of 10 people better off by taxing the rich. Any questions again? Yeah, uh, so, social housing. Uh, oh. Uh, there's a, there's a, a chronic uh, lack of social housing right across the UK and it's, it's in Glasgow as well. And uh, you have to ask yourself uh, what this particular administration and previous administrations have done in Glasgow to try and uh, mitigate that. Uh, if you look at what we would like to do, or what I would propose to do in future, every time publicly owned land is sold off for housing development, social housing or community housing projects should be offered the land first if they can raise the funds to build social housing and the council should support them and get involved as much as possible. That's absolutely crucial. Liam raised a good point about uh, Kelvin Locks. If you take Glasgow Harbour, um, Stuart Clay, the Green Council, had somebody over from Rotterdam to look at the... Uh, because a lot of cities are redeveloping the harbour areas, and he said uh, there's a great opportunity missed here. If you look at Glasgow Harbour Development, how much social housing is there? How much? Is there a community centre? Is there a playground? Is there any public parks? Are there any public spaces at all? Any public amenities? There isn't any. None. It's all sold off to private developers, and it's a monstrosity apart from anything else. And it's this existing and previous administrations that have endorsed that. So we need to change the whole attitude of um, property development, not sell off playgrounds and playing fields to uh, private property developers. Locally, we have um, Kelvin Meadows, is another good example, where people want to retain the land for uh, public use, either as allotments or a public space or public park. And um, the council are pretty much, pretty much prosecuting persecuting these people uh, for, for wanting to put the land to use, but it's been sold off to a private property developer. So yes, it goes without saying we support social housing at every level, and we think the council could and should do much more than they do. Um, coming back to council tax, yes, it's a regressive tax. It uh, disproportionately uh, affects people on low and average incomes. And we have for a long time advocated we should change the council tax to something called land value tax. In essence, land value tax puts a, land, a value on the land, and this means that 80% of council tax payers will be better off because it brings into use, or brings into the tax revenue system all the empty properties that are lying about, and all the empty land, the derelict land that's lying about, that's being land backed by companies and private individuals who then get tax breaks. If you forward, if you, people have to pay a tax on the value of the land, it also gets rid of land speculation, which means that value, land value will go down, which will then mean that social housing and anybody, and an individual who wants to buy a piece of land to build a house, will have access to it. It makes it much fairer. So, there is an alternative. Now the facts are, whatever anybody says, the next five years, we are stuck with the council taxes, as it is, thanks to the Scottish Government. Um, Let's say the SND, they've basically passed on and uh, were chastised. We cannot change that. So, there's a fixed budget. So we can look at two ways. We can implement some cuts, which are deeply unfair and aggressive, 
or we can look at ways of raising revenue. And that comes back to one of the points that we want to do. We want to look at ways of raising revenue or working more effectively, more efficiently. So yes, that's, it is, it's a progressive tax and we'd like to change it. Okay, thanks. And uh, the next question is to Mr. Razak directly. As you've mentioned education, can you tell me how many schools did you vote to close and what you aim to uh, bring a primary school education back into the Whitefoot? Thank you. Well, um, close two schools in Whitefoot. Um, regrettably, um, I did try to support keeping at least one of the schools during that period. It's one of my, how should I say, you know, disappointments throughout my nine years as, as a councillor um, of not being able to uh, keep a school in the life. I endeavour to, once resources are available, and I don't think they have got to be realistic, because uh, that's about the Scottish Government coming on board as long, uh, along with the City Council to make sure that this area does have a primary school in the future. I do appreciate the points to make. Uh, we will get through that. We'll have a few questions just to Thank run through. Okay. okay, to all candidates, what are their party intending to do about the continuing gender inequality in our society, and in particular, violence against women? and women being killed by partners. Okay, so again, right to left. Um, it's, it's a terrible indictment of our society these days that this still happens uh, amidst us. Um, and I think we, we need to get the services that we have um, to support victims more than they do at the moment and have robust action taken against perpetrators. And maybe we need better legislation which is, which is not uh, <coughs> local council, but the Scottish Parliament. And certainly that's something I will raise with my colleagues, uh, MSPs, about this and whether that should be taken forward. Um, apart from action from police with existing laws that are there, we will be pushing for more um, quicker justice within the prosecution system because sometimes you can get a bottleneck in terms of you know the perpetrator being arrested and, and the court going you know the case going to the court and how how fast that is dealt. And it's about I know a while back the word um, court uh, facilities that actually fast tracked cases like that. But I think we need to do more on that so people are not waiting long times to see that justice or because that's a preventative measure because if the case doesn't go ahead that person is out there uh, possibly you know maybe committing more of that violence i think it needs to be quicker through the court so it's resolved and sentence passed as quick as possible okay. yeah i think uh, obviously there are still huge problems with gender inequality in society and um, the SSP is very committed to tackling these. Um, there's huge cuts which are um, going through at the moment, which are hitting women the hardest um, in terms of childcare and all sorts of things. So I think absolutely. Um, yeah, and in terms of attacking violence against women, I think there does have to be increases in funding for the organisations which are trying to tackle that, rather than cuts which are being uh, going through to women's organisations at the moment, which we would absolutely see a long term increased funding for all the organisations that are trying to tackle violence against women. Yeah, uh, gender inequality, that uh, goes right throughout society, right from uh, access to childcare to uh, uh, board of sports direct directors and companies. There's a huge lack of uh, female representation. Uh, as it happens, the, the Scottish Green Party actually has a gender balancing uh, policy, 60-40, uh, so there should never be more than 60 40 either gender represented or standing as candidates and if anybody follows uh, there's a blog written by two uh, researchers at Edinburgh University uh, we are in fact the only party that has more than 40 percent female candidates standing in the local elections in Scotland uh, all the other parties have considerably less 
uh, so we actually have a, <coughs> we have addressed it internally in terms of candidates, and um, it um, it's something that we need to look at, and especially when it comes to protecting children and uh, and women against violence, there are currently uh, some cutbacks happening uh, locally, and we would certainly reverse that. We would prioritise, despite the the budget constraints, we would prioritise anything to do with children, uh, certainly anything to do with protecting violence against uh, children and, and women in this case, uh, goes without saying. And as a councillor, there isn't much we can do in terms of changing the law, but we could do a lot locally to support uh, the victim support centres that are here. We could do a lot to, uh, to, assist, to assist them. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to take two questions this time. How do you feel about Alios and governments favouring one company over any other company? That's the first question. Second question, what will be your first priority if elected? Again, I'm going to go right to left. Sorry, could you... The, the, uh, the first question, how do you feel about Alios and governments favouring one company over any other company? Um, Alios... Um something that's been necessitated to, to make sure that departments have resources to deal with issues uh, and to protect frontline services. Um, Alios, as most of you know, are uh, council-owned. They're not private organizations as such. They are private, uh, they are uh, council-owned. And if at any point it is felt by councillors that they're not doing the job that they were supposed to do, they can be brought back into the council, fam uh, council uh, family. Um, I think some of them have been necessitated by uh, resources uh, in terms of... Uh, just to explain that, if you look at uh, some of the services, um, for instance, Cordia, uh, there is a legal um, aspect to that where any department within any council, it's not just Glasgow, any uh, council, if it does not meet, uh, balance its budget for three years, then the government has any, every right to take that service away from the council and put it out to tender to private organisations. Therefore, one or two of the alios, from my understanding, were due to that fact that <coughs> historically they had not balance their budget for originally, but for three years that balance has to be carried forward. Therefore, if the final year, if, if, if the budget doesn't balance, then the government could, it's taken out of the council's hands really. So therefore, one of the two alios were made to, to, to really to, to protect that service. Um, I am not a fan of alios personally. I would rather that the, everything stayed within the council and, and fully under the control uh, of the council. However, um, there are necessities with, with recession and other things that services are protected and that's the only way to protect them. Okay, the other question is what would be your first priority if elected? I, I said earlier on, if I mean generally constituent concerns are taken up day by day, that's, that's the, the, the day, day, day to day work. Uh, the other thing that I would like to do, if, if at all possible, is the issue about the school and uh, if the money was available I'd be working to make sure that there is a school within this area uh, because I think if we don't have a school from one end, uh, from uh, Queen's Cross, uh, Dunar Street up to the top of Mary Hill and that's, that's not that's not what we are here for, to be honest. That's not why I want to be a councillor or was a councillor for. You want to have serves, not take them away. And that's a disappointment for me, to be honest. I mean, people will question me and everything, but I, I tried my best at the time to support and keep at least one school of the two that were closed here. But um, I didn't succeed in that. But if money comes available, that would be my priority. Okay, um, in terms of arm's length organisations, it strikes me as an absolutely bizarre setup. What city building can do that the old building services can do, what Cordia can do that home care services can do, I 
don't understand that at all. I think these things do need to be brought back under council control. It seems to be a setup that does pave the way for privatisation, it paves the way for councillors to take large salaries sit on the boards of these alleyways, whereas they should be doing their job as councillors. Um, so yeah, I do, I do think these things do need to be brought back under council control, I'm not a fan of alleyways at all. Um, in terms of my first priority as councillor, I think housing issues do need to be taken very seriously, from clapping down on rural landlords to GHA, which I'm sure some residents think is one very large rural landlord, and the other housing associations. So, yeah, I think housing issues um, are absolute priority. Yeah, I can really echo what Liam just said. Uh, we're certainly against the uh, LEO's arm's length executive uh, organisations. Its uh, next step is to privatise them. Uh, these are services that the council did quite adequately in the past, and if there was a problem with the budget on balancing after a number of years, it would be the prudent thing for the auditors or the councillors or the, civil, the senior civil servants of the council to address that before it becomes a problem. So that's a poor excuse for me, creating an LEO. And furthermore, it's, uh, it's completely undemocratic that uh, some councillors are appointed to these boards and then taking a salary for things that uh, previously would have been one of your responsibilities as a councillor. So we would certainly try and bring them back under council control, make them more transparent and more accountable. Uh, that goes without saying it's utterly undemocratic. And it's an unnecessary cost to the council. As Liam said, it doesn't necessarily make it any more efficient. Uh, we can give lots of examples on that. One is that British Telecom was uh, quite successful there, and uh, now it's making huge profits that technically could have been uh, the treasuries and benefit society. So it's a form of privatisation and uh, we're not a fan of it and we certainly won't take up any seats on LAOs, uh, certainly not paid seats. Um, so I echo what uh, Liam just said, it's something we need to address. In fact, Glass for Life is an LAO and uh, it's a nice example uh, of what's going on at Mary Hill Park at the moment. Uh, Martha Wardrop of uh, the Green Council of Hill Head has intervened in Strathclyde Police and Glass for Life and apparently it is going ahead, going ahead on Sunday without anybody being arrested. Uh, including myself, if I, if I manage to turn up, I've got to do that canvassing as well. Um, the same question, uh, what's the first thing I would do? I, I honestly don't know what the first thing is I would do. Um, I'd like to think my priority would be to see what feedback I get from uh, my surgery, the first surgeries, or what people tell me needs to be addressed. It seems like to get a primary school within Wineford, certainly, not within the war, but within Wineford, it seems like the, the primary school is one of the main concerns here. So that's perhaps something I would look at. How we address that? Because it's ridiculous that anybody should have to be transported by bus or car to a primary school. Everybody should have a primary school within walking distance, within reason. Okay. The next question is again to Mr. Razak directly. Do you support North Kelvin Meadow to continue as a meadow? Yes. As long as it meets the legal requirements. Yes. Okay. And. Before we take hands, I'm just going to ask again, uh, are the candidates prepared to meet with community leaders if elected? Mr. So Vazic has already said that he will. Other candidates? Yeah, that's good. good ah, yeah. So it's, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> rhetorical question. <laughs> just that's important to get that one clarified. For me, it's a rhetorical question. It goes without saying that you meet with people you represent. Just it's not thing as yeah, it's right. not like to ask. Yeah. When you say leaders, what, what does that mean? Is it community council, chairs, or group chairs, or leaders of what sort of People who want to see their communities improved and are taking action to do so. Uh, okay, the next question. Uh, obviously, we've covered this a little bit. Uh, what's been going on at uh, Maryhill Park and you know the running track and tennis courts? Will you be joining us on Sunday uh, to uh, you know basically bring a bit of of uh, you know exposure to this issue and try and improve the area? Sadly, I know I'm aware that it's going to go ahead and, and uh, Glasgow Life staff are going to be there uh, to, to, to you know make sure everything goes well, but um, certainly. Um, I'm not too sure what time it is, I uh, uh, because I have other things I'm doing on Sunday. I'm just going to be truthful about it. Details you have to hand out on <laughs> At 3.30pm or, or something now. I'm sorry, I'm not going to make it. I'm just trying to... Same question again. Yeah. Alright, I certainly hope to be there on Sunday. I yeah. have uh, exams for this for the moment, but I should be there. Yeah, likewise, I'm hoping to be there as well. 
Okay, good. And uh, Liam Turbot has already made clear his intention to support the community agenda, which you're here. Uh, would the other candidates represented here be prepared to make their views known on each of the issues raised in that agenda? There's a copy there. Yes, sir. And while obviously we do that, I'm going to ask for a show of hands for any other questions that people may have. Okay, I'm going to take them in order left to right, so I went right to left. So, we'll go first, Chapman. Ah, it's Mr. V. Does that, does that, I do apologise again. Thanks, Ty, I've been talking a lot today. Um, two points. You said there you tried to stop the school closures, yet your voting record shows. Could that have been an ultimate sanction on your group in the Labour administration? Will she speak out? Will she say, I've got concerns? Then the schools were closed because of the buildings weren't fit for purpose. That was the whole point of the, the school closures in this city. Buildings were not fit for purpose for children to get into. It wasn't they safe. You then go on to hang it and you left six class D. Class D, if anybody knows their alphabet, is a step above C and B. You close schools with C status and B status in this city, right, because they weren't safe, but left six of the most health and safety risk in this city, because D was the highest band you could get. And yet you close the school and then you come back and tell people when they were protesting and, and try to keep the school open, we can't do it because of the health and safety. Yeah, yeah, when the protests hang out and the people took to uh, occupying their schools, you then turned the corner and we've now got the hub. So you can't have it both ways. And I would say, can you tell us exactly how you voted? If you were so concerned about having a school in here, how did you actually vote? Did you toe the party line or did you vote against that? The other question I have, and you can answer the two of them if you don't mind, and that's it finished. You say there you, you're thinking you support the medal, I've got it written here, right? You're supporting the medal, campaigners, and their fight against, I think it's a few years now. I've supported them, it's in my award. Totally support them. We can't lose any more green space in this city for house and developers and the profiteers. Yet, could you tell me how you voted when this was going through committee? When your group put it through, how did you vote against the group to show your dissent and say to them, I'm supporting the medal? Because I think if you're track record and people go back and check it, I think you find you're no sincere, you're disingenuous here. Because at the end of the day, you voted with your group to sell it off to the private developers to put houses up, 92 flats, starting price 650,000 quid. When we've got people in house and benefit, council tax and here's no arrest it. So I would ask you, in those two points, you tell me you supported a school with remaining here. How did you vote on the day? You tell me you support the medal. How did you support that? The ultimate sanction, vote against your group. Don't toe the party line and represent the people you were put in to represent. No toe the party line at every turn. And that's your cop out one. I didn't, I couldn't. I couldn't. How did you vote? Tell the people how you voted the two issues. Thank you. Um, first of all, can I say that it's not at all about voting. It's what you do before the voting that, that matters. I tried everything. I met with officers. I met with a leader at the time. And also, for your information, I voted against the closure of this school. Check the uh, records. That, please check the record. Yeah. In terms of the medal, I was asked, would you support it now? And I said, as long as legally it was, you know, it was okay, I, I would do that. That's what I said. Yeah. Can I just clarify something there, just to go back in? Because that's just a gentle game. You actually voted to put that through as a proposal with your group. So you can't say now you support it when you actually voted against it to close it and, and chip that the medal uh, occupiers and campaigners offer. You've, you've voted with your group to take them to court, to evict them. You can't have your cake meet it. You can't say one minute, you know, I now support them, but yet you voted on it and voted to get them off and give it to the developers. The, the question I was asked was, would you support them now? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, last week you did, not 
Okay, right. As I said, I would go okay. left to right. Uh, Mark there. Well, with myself, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask a question to the SNP candidates. Um, the SNP uh, weren't prepared to be on camera, I'm afraid. Uh, they they, they were here, but they were not here. They were to me. I'm here as a tenant tonight, by the way. I stay in the area. Okay. I mean, that, that's the position now. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but I think it'd be good. Yeah. Well, the question I was going to ask is, uh, during the school campaign, I mean, I stay, stay with the corner there, I've got three kids in that, you know. Uh, we were promised repeatedly, right, if, you know, we voted for an SNP government in this election, we were guaranteed we're going to get a school. No, maybe no, within the Wineford, but certainly in the local community, you know. So I was going to see how that was progressing, actually, you know, because we're, you know, we were promised numerous occasions, so I might to see, but I mean, how's that, how's that progressing? But obviously, you just can't answer that. You know, I mean, we have a lot of promise and more given guarantees for Bob Dorris, you know, on numerous occasions, you know, so we just might hate we we'll see how that's going, you know, but obviously nobody can answer that. I mean, certainly if, 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 if I'm each here, if... Well, no, I think, <coughs> in all fairness, the, the question was to the SNP, not, not to yourself, it's an answer. So, we'll maybe just need to leave that, um, unless... Mr. McAllister would be prepared to... Here is a tenant tonight, a tenant. nothing more. Nothing yeah. less. Right, uh, other questions? Uh, again, it's back to Mr. Zach. That's over the schools again. I did ask how you voted for the closure of other schools. As a resident within here, what I seen was the Labour Party saying, in each constituency, we'll vote to save your school. Yet, exactly. totally disregarding the people of their individual constituencies, totally disregarded, then voted en masse under a whip to shut down every school. We were lucky to save the school up at Rock, uh, uh, special needs school, school at Rock Hill. And uh, I think it was Bella Houston, I was over in the South, said, we only saved two out of that. Yet every one of the Labour Party says they opposed the school closures. Can you please verify why you didn't do what you said you used to do and oppose the closures? That's that's how the, that is how your constituents will stand by you if you do their work, not hand <coughs> The same amount of money you saved to big business the day or the week after you shut down all the schools. After they vote, I was 45 million went to big business to bring business into Glasgow. The same amount you saved within the same amount you saved off the school's budget. I did say it's that I, I did say that I voted against the school closure here, and also I did say it's not just about the voting; it's what goes on before that, how you go about trying to see if, if there is ways out of that. And, and we did certainly, myself and the Lord Provost attempted it. Every move that we could do, trying to save at least one school, so I can stand by that. Okay. Right, I'm going to ask the, the candidates now, are they prepared to commit to the community agenda or elements of it? Uh, Liam has already made his commitment clear. Um, just a like, same question to Mr. Razak and Mr. Parrish. Can I say in terms of area committees, we have tried meeting outside the chambers. Uh, we've had a meeting in this building. We've had a meeting in the library. Um, so therefore, it's not a problem if the community want them, and you know, in terms of locally, if they want uh, a meeting locally, then it's not a problem. I've done it. I was the chair. Um, however, can I say that it does not improve actual people attending? I mean, more, the idea we had for bringing it out was more local people could actually come along to these meetings and, and have their input. Unfortunately, we, we didn't get that. Uh, but then again, maybe there was a number of reasons for that, but certainly I'm, I'm open to that. Um, also, um, in terms of transparency, we, we have said that um, council meetings could be, I'm not sure whether it's televised or taped or somewhere so people can see them. Um, just trying to read this. What Glasgow, this is question, what Glasgow Council, City Council's common fund is? Common good fund. Common good fund is. This is, a, my understanding is this is, this is a fund that 
people have left money to the council which has been invested and the money that um, I think the interest on that that the money that's uh, interest on that is used for certain civic aspects of things which the Lord promised has control of. So that's my understanding of, of, of the good, uh, the, the, the good uh, common good fund. What response are you regarding? The only responsibility a councillor, not just me, any councillor would be have for the common good fund, from my understanding, it is reported at the financial uh, committee Finance and Audit Committee of the Council in terms of where that money is spent. There's a whole list of where that money